What a powerful, what a wonderful, what a beautiful name. The name of Jesus, the very one we're going to be zooming in, focusing so clearly on, Lord, over this series. And we just pray on this first message of our One at a Time series, Lord, you would come. Wonderful God, and speak. We're ready. We're listening. We're leaning in. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's great. Please be seated. Thank our servants this morning. Hey, tech guys and welcomers and band and, and everyone that's blessed us. That is great. It was a very half-hearted clap, I thought, it was this morning. It was clapping a lot, I suppose. That's good. Um, actually, I've got a video I want to play from our episode one, just an extract. Thanks. Let's start with this morning. I recently Googled the phrase, most impactful person in history. I guess I wasn't too surprised to find that Time Magazine has already put together a list. The top 100 most influential people to ever live. Started scrolling through the list, wondering where Jesus would be on it. And sure enough, right there at the top, number one, Jesus. I'm not too surprised by that. I mean, even if you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, it's hard to deny the impact he's had on this world. Think about it this way, you can't even write down today's date without acknowledging that all of history is divided into the time leading up to his birth and the time since. You look back on it now and his impact seems obvious, but when Jesus was born, it just didn't seem like he was put in a position to have that kind of impact. It didn't seem like things were in his favor to be a person with that kind of influence. I mean, just think about it. Jesus was born the child of poor peasants. He grew up in this um, remote podunk town, lived in obscurity for 30 years, did some work as a carpenter, uh, never ventured more than a few hundred miles away from where he was born. He never went to college. He was never voted into office, never had a title or a position that would have looked good on a resume. Uh, Jesus didn't have you know, uh, thousands of Facebook friends or millions of Instagram followers. He wasn't TikTok famous, didn't have a YouTube channel. He never tweeted. I don't think he did. He, he never even had his own podcast. He was a homeless preacher. He spent a few years traveling around preaching. He was arrested and he was sentenced to die a common criminal's death. And yet here we are, a couple of millennium later, and he is Time Magazine's most impactful person in the history of the world. And so the question for us is, how did he do it? And the conclusion I came to is one at a time, one at a time, like that's it. Jesus did life with a zoom lens. When someone stood in front of him, time stopped. Everything else in his life, all of his concerns and his agenda and his plans, his goals, his schedule for the day seemed to just be put on pause. Everything seemed to just blur into the background. The only thing that mattered was the person standing in front of him. And Jesus changed the world one person at a time. This is the way of the gospel. Um, you've seen these before. This is a uh, coin viewer. Um, and it was created to help people focus in on something specific in the midst of a vast landscape. Uh, they are built for the purpose of zooming in and staying focused on something that you wouldn't see if you're not looking through it. And I would just say one at a time living starts with a zoom lens. It starts with learning how to focus on the one. So today we're going to start introducing that theme with a, um, looking at a zoom lens. Um, this is how Jesus lived his life. He zoomed in to focus on one person at a time and and as we study the gospel stories over the next six weeks we're going to see that both on our sermons on Sunday in connect groups as well and I pray that's going to give a real focus to our lives and a focus to our church moving forward you know if you study Jesus life in the gospels there's so many one at a time stories uh, like Jesus um, if somebody wrote a, a book and studied our life at the end we pray that our lives would be remembered for this, wouldn't it? You know, that, that we would be remembered as people who always had time for the one like Jesus. One at a time, people live like Jesus who saw beyond the crowds to one person with a need, someone far from God, a person who might be unseen by most. It's safe to say that followers of Jesus want to be like him 
And, uh, and we're going to see in this series that this is a very clear example of Jesus to follow. Um, think about one person today that you want to be in heaven or, or to follow Jesus on this earth. How do you imagine that's going to happen for them? Um, first, it's always a work of the Holy Spirit, the one who opens a person's eyes and awakens them to, to Christ. It's, it's the work of Jesus who gave his life on the cross and, and rose again. It's always all his work. But how does God usually do it? Um, perhaps one day uh, they will wake up and think, oh, I'm going to go to church. And while they're there, they're going to hear a gospel presentation. They're going to respond and be saved. Maybe that's how it'll happen. That happens. That's happened in this church. We have seen that happen. But if that's kind of the main way that God will always do it, then we just wait. And one day our family, our friends, our neighbors are just going to eventually just come here. But when I read through the gospels, I'm not sure that's God's primary way of working. Most times he sends someone to them, a person who may not know they're even being sent, um, but just notices a person, a follower of Jesus, and, and, and has a conversation, um, shows an act of love, something simple, and that awakens, something happens, and that actually can change a person's life. When you think about a loved one, you pray someone who loves Jesus, you, you pray someone who loves Jesus will see them, will have a wise conversation, will show them love and help them. You're going to pr you, you pr and pray with them, pray for them. Of course you hope that. And that really helps us connect with this idea of one at a time because there's people praying that we would be that person to see and connect with and share with their loved one. You know, one at a time, living begins with living life with a zoom lens, which focuses on seeing someone, like really seeing them. Um, and maybe you know what it's like today to be really seen. Um, someone has seen you at a time when you felt unseen, unnoticed, or even forgotten. And, and as you felt seen, it was just like Jesus was reaching out to you. But it's hard to live with a zoom lens because we live in a time that's all about the selfie lens. You know, when we were, when we were on our, our pilgrimage, I had the coolest selfie stick um, anywhere. So this thing not only is a selfie stick, but you push the bottom button like this, and it becomes a tripod. How cool is that? And it's got this little button you pull off, and so you can put your, your camera on it up high, and, and you can click the button, and it takes a photo. How good is that? People don't even know you being a, a narcissistic selfie taker and because uh, you got it on the stand and um, my kids pointed out um, if you go to the next slide that dad you know when you've got when you got the button you don't actually have to point it at the thing to work you know you you kind of pretend that it's not there so uh, I sort of got a lot of pictures where I'm going like this and uh, <laughs> But, you know, the thing about a selfie is when you take one is you're always smiling, aren't you? Um, you're capturing a happy moment, even if it's not a happy moment. You know, you're, you're smiling, but it's true. But is that true that life with a selfie lens is the happiest? Is that true? What's your experience? Martin uh, Seligman um, is known as a world expert on happiness. How's that for pressure on your life? <laughs> He's got a PhD in psychology, and happiness is the focus of his study. And, uh, and he writes on happiness, and he says that many people think that happiness really comes from focusing on self, meeting my needs, uh, feeding my appetites, uh, and therefore I'll be happy if I just have more of something than I have now. You know, maybe more money, more time, more chocolate, more friends. Um, I don't know what order they come in. You fill in the blank, whatever that could be. But he says the problem with more is more is always a moving target and, and very difficult to ever hit. And he talks about the happiness paradox, um, that happiness isn't found actually in self-focus, me at the center. It's found in focus on others, the other-centered person. And uh, he, he actually did an experiment. He got a group of um, young people and he... And he sent them out to do something selfish, you know, um, whatever would bring pleasure. Maybe it was uh, to eat ice cream or go to a movie or, you know, spend a day at a day spa getting pampered or whatever that might be. 
and they came back and they measured how they felt, the afterglow of that, and then they sent the same people out uh, to do something for others, an altruistic sort of act, you know, to serve someone in need, to, to, to help somebody purely for their benefit, not for yours, and then they uh, recorded the afterglow results of that, and the results were an absolute game changer in this study. The afterglow of pleasure, pleasurable self um, things paled into insignificance compared to the afterglow of one selfless act for another. It wasn't even close to the incredible joy that a person feels when they just reach out to another person. You know, there's a default setting that we think we'll be happy if we focus on ourselves but we find greater happiness is found on focusing on others and we're saying one at a time. I mean, that's counterintuitive. It's also countercultural. You know, anyone who studies marketing will tell you that we're exposed to hundreds, if not thousands, of ads a day without even realising it. They pop up everywhere, all trying to grab our attention to focus on their product. And the message seems to seep through that if you just consume and keep consuming, you'll be happy. If we keep at it, eventually you're going to find that next thing or amount of things that are going to make us happy. You know, maybe the next thing is the thing. You know, that's going to be what's going to get me there. But in the end, we look at it and it's just consumption, isn't it? It's just more. And sometimes there's this influence actually creeps into our relationships and where people actually become commodities. Um, you know, if I get something in return in this friendship, this relationship, I'm going to invest, otherwise I'll move on to another one that makes me happier. You know, side note, if, if you think a relationship is the other person making me happy is the goal, it's not going to be a happy relationship. It's not going to work. So this cultural idea of happiness can often, though, spill over from things even into people. But Jesus was, is countercultural when you study his life. He lived differently and he focused on the one. He saw people, he saw their needs, and he had compassion enough to do something about it. And we see this through the Gospels, and he even taught about it. In Luke 15, we know those three famous parables about the one. They're one at a time parables, where there's one lost sheep, or one lost coin, or one lost son. But we see this repeated sort of theme in each that Jesus is teaching and he's saying that, that Jesus sees people, he, he saves people and he celebrates when they are brought home. This is what God is like. He sees, he saves, he celebrates. That's who Jesus is. And he invites us to join him in this. And Jesus told these parables to a very diverse uh, group of people. Just let me uh, read these first two verses. Now, the tax collectors and sinners are all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know, capture that scene. The tax collectors and sinners gathered around Jesus because he saw each one of them. But the religious leaders didn't see people. They saw sinners. Uh, they put them into kind of categories of sin. You know, that's why you always see tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors have got their own category of sin. And that's what religious, religion tends to do to people. You know, people who sin for a living. Tax collectors, prostitutes are mentioned in, in the Gospels. And the Pharisees also see those who are called sinners, generally identifying a person more with something that they've done as their identity. <laughs> And Jesus fought religion when you read the Gospels probably more than anything else because of what it does to people. It identifies people with sin as if that is who they are instead of separating a person's value and worth and identity from their behavior. It's not hard to be a Pharisee, is it? It's to see ourselves as good people who make mistakes sometimes but they're bad people, particularly if we've been wounded by them. They are what their sin is, and the names flow. They're a liar, they're a cheat, they're a manipulator. They're a you know where it goes. 
You know, we can at the same time celebrate being forgiven and saved and getting this grace that we don't deserve, but be really poor students of our saviour Jesus, who never viewed a person's identity and worth through the lens of their sin. That's not approving it, but it's not identifying them through that. Jesus zoomed in on the very people who the religious people cropped out of the scene. And he was criticised for it. What did they say? What was their criticism? Jesus welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Have you been criticised for that? Have I? Do we do that? Do we expect sometimes for people to come and be uncomfortable in our comfortable place and we'll welcome them there? Or can we be uncomfortable in their comfortable place? The word welcome here used is a word used for welcoming someone into your family. That's what this kind of welcome, and, and, and the religious leaders knew that. So Jesus welcomed sinners like sons and daughters coming back home. That's what they could see. They might be involved in, in lifestyles not, not in line with Jesus' values, but that's not how he sees them or identifies them. Maybe he saw the tax collector a bit like he saw the prodigal son. Someone who just wanted a bit more, who chased after money, and it led them away from God and eventually into a place where their life was actually a mess as a result. The prodigal son couldn't see a path back to the father, except maybe as a servant or a hired hand. Maybe that was the way back. And religion would agree that a payment plan is the only hope. Uh, just a right amount of good works and enough things so God will accept you again. But then, then Jesus is like the Father who welcomes them in this gathering as family before anything has changed or even been paid for. And the religious leaders say he is just messing up the system. You know, take notice in the, in the Gospels when Jesus actually refers to someone as a son or a daughter. You notice that he says that again and again. This week we're going to study in Connect Groups the story of the woman, as I said, who reached through the crowd to trust Jesus. And he said, daughter, your faith is healed. You go in peace. Daughter, he says. You know, as a father, that helps me connect with what Jesus is doing in, in whatever story I'm reading, if he's calling someone a son or a daughter. He sees people in need of rescue or help in the same way I see my own son or daughters when they need rescuing. I can connect with that. I remember when Christy was uh, in the Middle East last year and traveling around, um, trying to make some connections in the health sector, and turns out she's going to end up going back there next year to work in another place. But yet, as, a, as father, you always worry about your daughters, don't you? You worry about your sons too, but you really worry about your daughters. And I'm glad that she lets me follow her on Find My Friends. You know that app? She still lets me. She hasn't got rid of me. I'll find my friends. I'm, I'll just ride that wave as long as I can. And so I can track her. I, if, I know where her phone is. I know where she is. And... And that was somehow comforting when she's over there to know where she is. Because there's a little bit of Liam Neeson in all fathers, isn't there? <laughs> you know, she gets into trouble. If you've seen Taken, you know, gets into trouble. I'm going to charter a jet. I'm going to fly in. I'm going to rescue her from every situation. If I get a phone call, I'm ready with the line. I've acquired a special set of skills. <laughs> skills I've acquired across a lifetime that make life a nightmare for people like you. Yeah, I'm ready. Unfortunately, while I would do all I can to rescue my children from any danger and bring them home, I've got serious limitations. But Jesus is different. He sees people unnoticed and in trouble, and he sees them as family. And, uh, but he has the power to save. He has the power to change lives. Do you believe that today? Is that why we're here? And he's able to bring them home as sons and daughters. 
This is what the religious leaders could not accept, that somebody from God claiming to be from God was saying this and doing this, and that didn't fit into their categories of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus taught these parables because he wants religious people to know how God sees people. He loves religious people as well. He doesn't have favorites. But he wants them to see how God sees people. That no matter what culture or place a person is in life, no matter what lifestyle they have chosen, even how hard they seem, that no one is lost or hidden from God's vision. No one is beyond rescue. In the first parable, Jesus poses them a question. He says, suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Doesn't he? Um, I'm not sure. One sheep goes missing for 100. Does it matter? 100 seems like a lot, but 99 seems like a lot too. So the question he's sort of really asking is, does one really matter? Does one really matter? Jesus said, of course one matters. And the religious leaders weren't silly. They knew he was comparing them to those who they thought didn't matter. And Jesus just put them on equal value to God. The good shepherd will always leave the 99 and go after the one. And when he finds it, it says, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. You know, we often see this parable is referring to those who are lost who, who aren't Christians, maybe they're outside the church and, and we long to see become Christians and, and, um, and that's okay to, to do that and that's right too but as I read this, this parable again you know, that these sheep are those who belong to the shepherd and they wandered off and you know sometimes we might think of those who, who for some reason have wandered away from God and wandered away from his church, it used to belong you know maybe that's for some here today some listening online today and you need to know he, he actually sees you and he goes after you to bring you home and maybe he's done that again and again in your life and perhaps that's even happening today because he won't give up. He, he will keep going after you because you belong to him and he wants to bring you home. He, he will never stop. Well, his breath in our lungs pursuing us, that's what his God is like. I remember uh, one day, um, I think it was Matt, um, my son-in-law, alerted us to the fact that why is our car parked across the other side of the road from our house, but just not parallel to the car, um, the, the uh, footpath, but actually um, across the footpath on the grass. And we think that is really strange. You know, what is our car parked across there like that for? I mean, anyone driving past would think, well, you can park cars like that sometimes. No one really would have noticed it or thought much about it. But for us, it was where it shouldn't be. What I found out is one of my daughters, um, I won't name names, but had driven our car and parked it on the driver, which we were out at Bunya on acreage at the time, and, and it was a fairly flat driver, a slight incline, and they hadn't put the handbrake on, they'd gone inside. And so the car had just slowly rolled back, faster and faster, had gone across the road and up onto the footpath and stopped on the footpath. When I went and had a look at it, it was actually leaning against a star picket, and there was a, like a three metre drop behind that star picket. So here's this car. <laughs> um, I, I went in, I carefully put the handbrake on. That's the first thing you do. And drove it back over where it's home into the carport. It wasn't where it was meant to be. I, I noticed that it was all wrong because the car belonged to me. I noticed it was where it wasn't meant to be and it should be home. And on closer look, I noticed that it was dangerously on the edge of great damage, resting on a very weak post. So I took action. And I thought about that. And I thought that's a bit like what Jesus sees. And it's a bit like what he's calling us to see. See, when something belongs to you, you notice it. And you take responsibility for it. 
like that one sheep Jesus was teaching that that's the reason I go after it because it belongs to me and that's why we need to pray. Jesus, help me to notice people on the edge whose lives are teetering on a, on a flawed foundation that can give way and to see people like you see people. And then the shepherd picks up the sheep up and brings her home and celebrates. Really? Over one sheep when you have 99? Absolutely. God leads in the celebration. And then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. And I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. You know, as a church, we're always going to emphasise the importance of reaching out to those who are lost who don't know Jesus. Um, absolutely. And we look forward to many celebrations over people being found and coming home and ripping those covers off the baptism pool. And, but also, we are called to go after those who are part of the flock, part of um, the church, the family, who have wandered off. And when they come back, they're only going to get welcome, no shame, embrace, and we just love you as our family welcome home. Aren't we, church? You know, there's someone that needs to be seen by you. You know, ask God who that person is, who is not to go unseen. And as we go, we realize how powerful it actually is to be seen. It's powerful more than we can ever know. There's, a, there's an artist in New York called Devin Rodriguez, and he draws strangers on the New York City subway. And uh, one day he, he gave that drawing to someone there, and this is what happened. a powerful reaction there's 10 million people in New York City and probably the loneliest place in New York City would be the subway and somebody saw this woman and there's something so emotional about being really seen you know detail painted drawn um, this guy Rodriguez used to draw and collect um, the drawings and put them on a wall never used to give them to people that's kind of a scary thing isn't it like somebody's drawing people and put them on your wall um, you can go to jail for stuff like that and he, he'd post them up and nobody used to really like them much and, uh, but then he had a revelation and started to give them to the people and got millions and millions of views not so much for the art but just the reaction of people who were being seen now, that's not for everyone to do. If I tried that, I don't think I'd get a good reaction and I'd be on YouTube for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> and maybe that's not your calling either um, as a way to help being seen. But in your way, as God has wired you and made you, you can make sure one person is seen. You can make sure of that this very week, maybe this very day. And it can cause a powerful response in a person. It does to be seen. And that's because when you are seen, you, when you see someone, you represent the one who sees them. Jesus is looking through his people, the church. And that connection can actually be easily made. It can. That's why Jesus said in our great, our verse as a church, let your light shine before others when they see your good deeds... That's seeing them and reaching out to them. They praise your Father in heaven. That's the connections made. You know, sometimes a simple phone call, a text, say, hey, I haven't seen you for a while. Are you okay? You know, I've seen many people reconnect with the church simply because a Christ follower has, has noticed them and just reached out. 
You know, who's on your mind today? You could text them, have a coffee, whatever. But never underestimate the small things. I mean, the longer I've followed Jesus, been a pastor, I also love evangelism. I've often think people have in their minds that it's a really big thing. I've got to share the, all the points of the gospel and bring a person across to Christ or I'm not doing evangelism. I actually think it's often just the smallest things. I mean, God's going to be having a, a conversation that goes over a long time with this person. It's his job, he's saving them, but we play a part in that. I remember on the Camino, there's this one woman walking along and she said, oh, I don't believe in any of this religious stuff and don't really care about it. And, and then in the same conversation, she said, oh, karma's not really working for me. You know, I, I really want karma to work for me with some people in my life. So, you know, karma's actually a spiritual belief, you know. It's based on Hinduism and reincarnation. And so you believe in that? Oh, no, I don't believe in that. And I was thinking... Oh, and she said, oh, thanks for telling me that. I don't believe in karma anymore. <laughs> I, we did end up running into those people and having spiritual conversations later on, but that was all. And I thought, I thought you know, sometimes you're just pulling an untruth out, aren't you? Like, like that might be your role in, in a conversation. I don't know, like, like every time, you just got to believe that Jesus is in you and with you and he's already working before you come and after you go and you might just have something to say or something to show or something to do but but just notice and talk and and whatever that might be that day jesus saw a crippled man he saw a woman by a well and he saw the crowds of the ones harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd which is why he called the church to pray that the few would become the many workers looking for the one this is what jesus means when sheep wander off you know they don't mean to usually they just tend, you know, one reason they do is they follow their appetites. You know, if sheep just eat grass. And when they've eaten enough grass, they go over there to eat grass and then they go there and they just kind of follow it. And the next thing you know, a sheep can be alone and vulnerable um, and in danger and lost. And, and some may be listening today, here today, or you're like that now. You, you, you didn't intend to wander away. You just followed certain appetites and, and kept chasing those things and they came consuming and you wound up in a place where now you feel alone but you may not really see a clear path back to God. Well, I want you to know that Jesus sees you today and he comes after you. Another way, sheep wander is by following other sheep often blindly we know that about sheep in 2005 in turkey true story you won't believe it though 1500 sheep walked off a cliff one went first committed sheep suicide or something it just kind of went off the edge and then another one followed it and followed it and followed it and the shepherds were resting and they were shocked to find that all of their 1,500 sheep had gone off the edge. You can Google it. Only 450 died though because the rest kind of formed a pillow effect and, <laughs> and, and, and the rest of them sort of fell on that. Why are you laughing? <laughs> True story. It's crazy things happen in this world. But it's a thing. And it's the thing with people too, you know, maybe you followed others down a wrong way. You know, you've been influenced by certain things that seem so good, seem right, seem helpful, seem fun, to a place that actually you realise has destroyed many and somehow you've survived this far. But Jesus sees you and he wants you to be the one that would, would not follow the wrong things, but would actually follow him now. He leads you to follow him, to come back. And he promises you, I'm not going to lead you astray. As we sing this morning, I will never fail you, but to lead you into life. So maybe some have wandered and followed appetites or followed people or certain influences or certain ideas, but you are alone and in trouble and maybe you're not sure how to get back or that you were even seen, or that God would actually bother coming after you again. I remember being in that place. Not again. God, is he going to come after me again? 
I've made so many promises to not do that again or go there again or he's surely he's finished with me now. He's never finished with you. <laughs> he will never stop coming after you. He will never stop offering you the opportunity as his son or a daughter to come home. That's the Jesus I read about. I hope you do too. He will. He is. He will never stop. And it never changes how he sees you as, as somebody who belongs, who is meant to belong to him. Someone, sometimes people talk to me and, and say, look, oh, look I, I might follow God, but I'm searching for God. I'm, and, and maybe they've been searching for God for a long time. But, but I, I really think people need to know that God's not lost. In fact, it's the other way around. He's searching for you. He searches for people. Um, you just need to know that you're being seen and maybe it's more to stop hiding. You know, like in Genesis after the fall, Adam and Eve hide in the garden from God and he goes looking for them. They can't hide. We, there's no point hiding from a God who sees us. It's time maybe for some to come out of hiding because you have been found. And if you need a flock, if you need a place, then you can have it here. You're so welcome to have it here. I pray that we are a church who are like the tax collectors and sinners gathering around Jesus. Not supporting necessarily what they do, but their response to Jesus and the fact of how he sees them. You know, you're in good company if you're a sinner like us. <laughs> and you're so welcome to join us in this place as God's family. Lord, save us from being like the religious leaders who muttered and categorized and judged. We're not a perfect church. And if you're looking for one, I don't think you'll ever find one. Not until Jesus comes back. But it is our heart as a church to want to reflect Jesus' heart for the one. To be a grace church. To forgive, to love. Because we all need that. So come home. Help us do better at that. Let us welcome you and celebrate. And together, we all need to be like Jesus as he's calling us, as he showed us through his life to go after the one and to let God work through us to change this neighborhood one at a time. This is our prayer through this series and how you can respond today. In a couple of ways, maybe you are the one that needs to come home. You know, maybe the Alpha course has just landed at the perfect time as we're starting this series. Maybe it is. You know, that's a great first step to start. Just come and just look at the foundations of, of the beautiful gospel again and Jesus. Start again. Bed that foundation down. You're so welcome to be part of that. For others, get into a connect group. Let's, let's study this. Let's, let's, let's commit to this this term ahead as we do this series. But a practical one today is, you know, who is that one person on your mind? Is someone on your mind I know God puts out even as we look at these things? Take some action this week. Reach out so they know they're not hidden but they're seen. Let's pray together. Lord, uh, there's nothing like you, Jesus. There's no one better than you. We've met a lot of people. We've been to a lot of places, but, but you're just the greatest, Lord Jesus. When we look at your life and the way you lived, the way you saw people, the way you've seen us, Lord, God, we wouldn't expect that a God who is holy and great and mighty would actually have that kind of love for us so much that we could be seen as belonging to him as his own family. A God who came to this world in search of us. A God who would die on a cross and carry all of our wrongs so we could be forgiven and have life. No one makes up a God like that. It's, and that's because it's true and it's wonderful news. And I just want to thank you, Jesus, that that as for us who have been found here today, Lord, as we study this, Lord, that you change the world one 
person at a time. And Lord, sometimes we think we just need the right event or we need the, the right things that, that is going to make all the difference. And we need to pray and we need to do all these things at church. But Lord, the greatest power we have, Lord, as a church is out there, one person at a time, sharing love, praying with, caring for, and that is how people connect with you, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you would just help us and show us each as we are on how we can do that. And Lord, on a day like today, I couldn't stop to just pray for those of us who have been praying for a long time, for those in our families, our friends, those people that have wept many tears over, Lord, that maybe this could be the time. God, that when they would know they've been seen by God and they're called by God to come home, we ask and we pray for those prodigals today, Lord Jesus, to come home and to be found, we ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Let's finish with a song that we can respond to today. Um, Graze in the gardens. This is what God can do. Let's sing it with faith. As we finish our service today and after the service, we'll have some from the prayer team. If you'd love to come and pray for someone in your family or pray for God to help you in this mission, come and take advantage of that.